matter how we prepare ourselves, when tragedy strikes, it often throws us off the course that we have set for ourselves. And then when tragedy strikes again and again, how can we possibly handle it? How can we possibly move forward? Mary Potter Kenyon is my guest today, and she is someone who has suffered extreme tragedy more than once, and yet turned that tragedy into something where she could not only grow and raise her family, but to teach others and to help others through grief and sorrow, loneliness, pain, all those emotions that come with tragedy. You are going to love hearing Mary's story, and I'm sure you will be encouraged no matter what you're going through right now. Have you ever felt like giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel? Welcome to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. She's an author, health coach, and motivational speaker. Backed into a corner multiple times in her life, Carol shares with you stories on how she overcame some of the toughest obstacles a person can go through in life, but refused to give up hope. Rather than admit defeat, an opportunity was presented, and it involves each and every one of you. Carol will feature spectacular guests who will share their messages of hope, encouragement, and their inspiration to prove why life's adversities only make you stronger. And now, welcoming the host of the show, here's Carol Graham. Welcome to Never, Ever Give Up Hope. Each of my guests, no matter how difficult the circumstances that they were in, the circumstances that they were possibly facing, they never gave up. And as a result, they became successful because they saw themselves as victors instead of victims. They saw themselves as winners instead of losers. And each one of us, all of us have a story. And when we share our stories, very often we share them to help somebody else. Possibly they have gone through something or are going through something that we have ourselves endured. That's how we help one another. And so that is the premise of this show. We share our stories to help others. So I thank you to each of my guests. I thank you to all of my listeners because without you guys, we wouldn't have a show. With me today, I have Mary Potter Kenya. She became a certified grief counselor in 2017. So that's not that long ago. And her story really didn't start until about 2012. So she has come a long way. And that in itself should be a real encouragement for our listeners. Mary works as a program coordinator for Shalom Spirituality Center in Dubuque, Iowa. She lives there with the youngest of her eight children. Mary is widely published in newspapers, magazines, anthologies, and the author of seven books, including the award-winning Refined by Fire, A Journey of Grief and Grace, and we will talk about that today, and also her recently released book, Call to be Creative. I remember somebody asked me once, um, are you creative? And I said, no. And I thought, that is ridiculous. Because we all have that creative ability in us. And I know that uh, Mary is going to, to talk about this later on in the show, her new book, Call to be Creative, A Guide to Reigniting Your Creativity. Welcome, Mary. Thank you for having me. It's so good to have you here today. I've read your story and I paused very often as I was reading it just to feel what you were saying as you painted those word pictures of what you had to endure and what you were going through. And to top it off with young children, when your husband, who was a five-year cancer survivor, died during a heart stent surgery in March 2012, I can't begin to imagine what you went through emotionally, physically, spiritually, 
in every way. And four of your eight children still lived at home. You were only 52 years old and you had never worked full time outside of your house. And all of a sudden, you're faced with this. You had been a wife since you were 19 years old. Can you share with us that story, Mary? Yes. So I never expected to lose the man who had survived cancer. And our marriage was the best it had ever been since his 2006 cancer treatment. Mm. And it was actually after he'd come home from the hospital following the, the surgery. It was three days later during the night sometime his heart stopped. So oh, yeah. that was quite a shock, too, because he had survived the surgery and was doing doing well at home. So I didn't know what it was to be a widow. Widows are Widows are old, right? Yes, that's <laughs> and, a good point, right? Right. And I didn't know any other widows other outside of my mother and she had passed away 17 months before my husband so it was um a very dark time for me i i was lucky to have some wonderful people rush to my side i had my sisters who immediately dropped everything and came to to my side my adult children came but i also had an 8 year old daughter a 12 year old a 16 year old and a 18 year old at home yet. And mm-hmm. I had to deal with their grief too. So there was that. It was, um, I don't know if anybody's ever prepared for that. Right. But, but if you are maybe older, <laughs> you maybe expect that to happen. Right. But for some reason, I did not expect this man who had survived cancer and a s- surgery to, to be there one day and gone the next. What were the emotions that you were experiencing? But the first thing I was wondering is, because of your children being young, did you have to deal with guilt and or fear? Definitely fear. I the the one thing I felt guilty about is that I was not near next to my husband when he died. It's or that I should have known. I should have known. You you love somebody and you live with them for a, a long time, and you think, well, I should know if they're <laughs> if they've right. died. Right. But I came from upstairs. He was sleeping downstairs in a recliner after his surgery. It was more comfortable for him. And um, came downstairs, made coffee, sat there for a little while, and then went to wake him up to see if he wanted a coffee. And that only then did I realize oh. that he had passed away. So, um, and there was a lot of fear. What do I do yes, now? Yes. I mean, I didn't know how was I going to be out, how we were going to be okay. I had dependent on, on his income and how how do you do this for for one thing where's the where's the handbook that tells you exactly how to do this and i remember saying that to the funeral director at the funeral home when we were planning the funeral um where's the handbook wow. <laughs> tell me how to do this so like i said i was lucky that i had people that were there to support me emotionally i i think my sisters must have had a list or something that they were keeping track of who was supposed to visit me what day. They never told me that, but somebody was there every day dropping by. It got to the point, this was March, and I'd just leave my door open, wide open. Got up in the morning, left the door open so that somebody could just walk in. They'd find me either sitting at my table journaling or sitting on the couch writing and or journaling, and they would just come in and find me. And three weeks after he died, this was also a very vivid memory, nobody stopped and and their lives had to go on right really but i remember leaning across the couch because it was in front of the front window and just leaning out tears pouring down my face thinking where are they (laughs) you know where's where where are my people where is my yeah so it, it was it was a it was a dark and lonely time even though i had people who, who were there for me, my children and my siblings, you still have to grieve alone. I mean, it's it's your journey. They're, people can hold your hand and they can be next to you, and but it's still something you have to do. You have to get through it. How did you deal with anger? I don't remember being angry after my husband died. I certainly wasn't angry at him. I do remember being angry when my grandson died. 17 months later. Yeah, tell, tell us about that. So he was diagnosed with cancer a month 
after my mother died in 2010. So I wasn't even able to grieve my mother because I was there for my daughter. And that's one of the first times I saw my husband cry is because he was a cancer survivor. And so when he heard that this little boy, a five-year-old boy was going to be fighting cancer, he cried for that five-year-old boy. What kind of cancer was it? It was a Wilms tumor, which is around the kidney. And so it had moved up into his lungs so it was but he went into remission for a while when my husband had the heart attack it was probably the day we found out that his cancer had returned that jacob's cancer had returned only later when the doctors said uh that he's had several small heart attacks (laughs) did we realize the pain he experienced the night that we found out my grandson's cancer had returned was probably the beginnings of the heart attack for my husband. And how do you process that? One day at a time, (laughs) one day at a time. The only time I was glad my husband was gone was when we found out Jacob's cancer was terminal. So this was a, this was a three year battle for that little boy. Oh my goodness. And when he died that day, I thought, I'm glad my husband's not here to see this. On the other hand, it would have been nice to have gone through it with him together, right? Mm. Oh, yes. But still, I understand what you are saying. And and it was, you, you carried the burden, you carried the pain. And how did your, how did your children um, deal with all of this, both your husband and then uh, your grandson? So the daughter who was eight, I think... We've had the hardest time. It's hard to tell because when you're that age, you know what death means. You know it's permanent. But you don't have the capabilities to deal with it. You don't have the tools that maybe an adult has or even an older teenager. So we all dealt with it differently. And that was kind of hard for me at first, too, because I wanted to talk about I wanted to talk about David all the time. I wanted to tell strangers in the grocery store that I was a widow. I mean, and my daughters didn't want anybody knowing. They didn't want their friends to know, even though, of course, their friends probably knew. None of my children really wanted to talk to strangers. Definitely didn't want to talk to strangers. Hardly wanted to talk to people that they were close to about it. But I needed to. And um, by the time Jacob died, the eight-year-old was 10. And we didn't know whether to tell her that her nephew was dying. Oh my God. And so we asked hospice workers and we asked and they, they said, you know, would she treat him differently? Would she, would it be too hard for her? Um, it's the one regret I have is I think I should have just listened to my gut. She was old enough to be prepared. She was angry later that I had not told her that we knew that he was, um, going to lose this battle so it's it's all it's grief is messy it's messy for families it's messy to try to figure out and to know that's one of the reasons I became a certified grief counselor is because I wanted the tools to help people maybe I didn't do the right things with my children I didn't I was just feeling my way I was feeling my way in this dark darkness of grief trying to find the light switch that's kind of the way it felt like is you know how do we do this how do for ourselves how do we do this for others and how do we help somebody farther down that road who's just beginning on their grief journey what did you do like how did you alleviate the pain how did how did you get through it what if what did you learn take a step by step through that well i think i had a gut for what i needed to do and because i was a i thought it was because i was a writer i never journaled I had never been a journaler, but 48 hours after my husband died, I just instinctively turned to journaling. And so I pulled out a journal and the first thing I did was fill three pages of that journal of what I was grateful for. So I instinctively knew what I needed to do, but it was only after three months of journaling that I thought, wait a minute, how do people do this without journaling? That kind of started me on the road of delving into the science of bereavement and the science of grief. Because I figured we're all going to lose people. We are probably designed to, to withstand it. But where were the tools and how did we find the tools? So I was doing some research and found out that there's actually scientific research showing that the act of writing 
helps you work through things. So oh, I had instinctively, share that. Share that with us. so I had, ex- yes, I had instinctively turned to something that ended up showing being scientific research proved can help us. So expressive writing, it was, um, James Penna Baker is often considered the expert in expressive writing. So if you um, Google his name, you'll find that he's written about it and he studied it and he studied it in, with college students and he studied it with people who have lost their jobs. So the research proves that there is something to the act of writing things down, working them out in your, it doesn't have to be a journal, it can just be a piece of paper, you can throw it away when you're done. It's just the actual act of writing. And so that's what I turn to instinctively. Um, and do you, mm-hmm. Sorry, do you write, read it after you write it? Like, is that part of it? Well, I keep my journals, but when I find somebody who's very reluctant to try this, and the reason they're reluctant to try this is because they're afraid somebody else is going to see it. I tell them they don't have to keep that. I give them permission to dispose of it after they write it because the actual act of writing it out will be helpful. And then there's the people who want to use a computer. And I say, well, that's go ahead and write it out on a computer. But there's something about handwriting really? that is also healing. So there's a whole science to it. But I do keep my journals and I look back at them. So I have... I looked the other day, I'm on my 14th journal since 2012. And of course I journaled probably more during some of the tougher times in those um, those years. But by looking at what was helping me then, it can help me now. So I would write down the, maybe I'd read a book and something the person said, the author said, really touched me. So I would write, I would copy it down in my journal. And now I can look back and see, oh, this, with the start of the pandemic, I was looking at those old journals, looking for some of those little nuggets of wisdom that would help me now. And I could also see a progression in myself in how I was handling things. And uh, I, um, I can see how I grow and how I have healed from things. And then that gives me the confidence to know I can grow and heal in during tough times now. So when you journal, do you... Do you write your emotions and what you're feeling and also what happened or like, is it a combination of the two? It's a combination of that. I I will work my way through something. Well, why is this worrying me? And I I will work my way through it. Maybe a page or two later, kind of get some answers for myself is, okay, is this because of something else? Or sometimes I'm just copying down other people's words because I just read something that really helped me. I will clip things, put little clip, um, newspaper clippings and things in my journals of things that really hit home for me or things I want to think about. So it's some of my journals are a little more artsy and craftsy that I might draw some little doodles and pictures. So it's really what kind of what my mood is telling me to do. I've ripped out a couple pages and throw them away because I think, okay, if I died today, would I really want anybody seeing this? (laughs) But mostly I keep them intact and Um, I think I'm leaving. I didn't, I don't intend to do it for this reason, but I think at some point, if one of my daughters, I'm thinking more of my daughters, if they lose a spouse, I could loan them my journal and I could see, yeah, mom worked her way through that. I would have loved to talk to my mom about how did you handle this? Or what did you, did you have these feelings? Did you think about this? But my mom wasn't there anymore. So they will have, if I'm not there anymore, or even if I am there, and they lose a spouse, I have something that maybe will help them. And I also teach expressive writing for healing classes to help people through whatever kind of losses or because we've had a lot of loss in the last year, jobs and yes, our yes. everyday life. And we've got a lot of stuff to work with. So one, that's something I instinctively turn to as a tool. But there are other tools available for people who are working their way through grief actively because we can it's going to happen and the we're going to have these tough things we go through but we can actively work our way through them and maybe that's maybe that's just something that's part of my personality but i like to take take a little bit of act active control over what's happening that's the only thing we have in 
control over sometimes That's is what, how we point. handle yes. something. Yes. And also the reason I asked you, if you go back and read it over, mm -hmm. because sometimes we experience the same feeling mm -hmm. again and to go back and read maybe how you managed to get through it the first time. Mm -hmm. Is that part of um, that process as well? I sometimes wonder if I knew in the back of my head that I was going to be writing about grief and that I could then turn to my journals and know exactly what I felt like at mm -hmm. 10 weeks out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I knew that um, in the back of my head or if that's that came later when I decided I was going to be writing a book about grief. But to be able to say, okay, on March 28th um, this year, I felt like this or on... <laughs> Yes. For some reason, that feels like it has more power than saying, mm -hmm. well, I don't remember what I felt like. And if somebody asked me, well, how were you doing five months out? I actually can say this is how I was doing five months out. That's Not very good. Ex <laughs> that's an excellent point, because once you've been through something and you're on the other side mm -hmm. of it, you often forget the, you know, the journey. Mm -hmm. And to be able to help somebody, I'm sure that that is really helped in your counseling to mm -hmm. be able to help somebody and say this is what you can experience possibly you know mm -hmm. at this point and at this point and at this point and it does hopefully get easier so it's therapy mm -hmm. now how do you and you, you've touched on it a little bit but how do you alleviate the pain because even in journaling i at, or is or is that just a, a time factor like how do you get over the pain mm -hmm. of, of losing I, of loss i don't think we ever get over it we can move forward but we i never ever say to somebody <laughs> i would never say to and i've had people say that to me are you i even had somebody say are you done grieving yet oh, you know wow. um oh. done well no that's a <laughs> But the pain is, it's going to be there. And I know people who run away from it. And I did too. Sometimes my writing actually was running away from pain because as long as I was writing, I wasn't having to feel or deal with the, um, with the pain. But it's inevitable. It's going to hit sometimes. So I know a widow who got in an RV with her two youngest children and drove around the country for an entire year after her husband died. Um, she was homeschooling her kids, so she just went. And then she said she pulled into the driveway after a year and she broke. I mean, <laughs> because wow. yes. she was running away from yes. the pain. Yes, yes, yes. So it's it's going to be there, but we can use it. And that's the, the interesting thing is I learned how to use the pain. I used it in my writing. I used it in helping other people. And so there's a purpose then to the pain. That's a very good point. A stepping stone to mm -hmm. the net. Yes. And... When did you decide, or did you decide, or how did it happen that you became a grief counselor as a result? I think it was about a year after my husband died when I started thinking that maybe I could help other people through their grief because I was feeling like I had done some healing. But it was actually after my grandson died that my daughter kind of pushed me into it. She didn't push me, but there's um, compassionate friends it's for parents who have lost a child it's a wonderful group and it's a national group and my daughter must have seen something about it now she had seen that there was a huge conference in texas and she called me one day and she said i want you to go and speak at this conference in dallas texas and my first thought is um shouldn't you be going there you're the one who just <laughs> lost a child and my second thought was no matter what she asked me, I'm going to do it because there's so little I could do to alleviate her pain. She was right. my child. Yes. She lost her child. Yes. She was my child. And so I just said, okay. And so I somehow got a plane ticket and flew to Texas and I went to a, um, a grief conference and saw something I wasn't seeing in my own state. I wasn't seeing conferences for people who had lost this was for children but that had lost somebody for, for grieving and so at that time it was i believe 2016 i decided 
I just decide these things, <laughs> mm -hmm. that I was going to start a grief retreat for people who had experienced loss. And so that first year I brought in a speaker and I, I'm not sure I knew what I was doing, but it's um, been five years now that we've had this grief retreat. But I was, ex I was meeting people who had lost somebody to suicide or like lost the child. So it was a different kind of loss that I didn't feel like I had the tools to, it, it just felt like a different kind of loss. So that's when I decided to become certified grief counselor because I needed the tools to help them, those, those different types of grievers that I didn't experience personally. Would you be able to share if you have ever maybe in one of the retreats or, or even a one-on-one -on -one or done any research in children who have estranged from their parents? Because I hear more and more about that and the type of grief related between, or like, is it the same type of grief? Is it worse? Is it easier when you lose a child when they that change way. to leave you? Wow. I, that has to be a different kind of grief. And, uh, and same with people who have lost, I mean, even just losing their, losing their jobs. I mean, this is all different. Some people say, well, grief is grief. Well, it's different kinds of grief. It's different levels of grief. It's different kinds of pain. That's a kind of pain. I don't know. That's a kind of pain I haven't actually dealt with at our grief retreats. I'm trying to think of the most surprising person who appeared at one of our grief retreats, what kind of grief they have. But I have learned that sometimes in our grief retreats, we divide the groups up into ch child loss in one mm -hmm. room, mm -hmm. suicide loss in another, and then the other. So that kind of grief would end up in the other group. And because you can open up more if you know that the people have experienced that same type of grief. But, but yeah, that's that's that would be a tough one to deal with. The reason I ask you that is our son married with our his children who live in our same town. Uh, the day after we had our 40th anniversary mm -hmm. gala celebration, he walked away from us, and that was 10 years ago. Oh. Oh. And it is a very different type of grief because I certainly mm -hmm. have experienced grief through death. Mm -hmm. And many people, because I do write about this and I do speak mm -hmm. about this, have contacted me and wanting to, you know, to glean what they could because there's not a lot out there about mm -mm. it. That's why I asked you. Yeah. So I maybe challenge you to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is a lot of people that would probably really benefit from somebody with your expertise to speak, to share, to write mm -hmm. about this type of, and maybe even to interview those who have gone through this and how they have, how they have dealt with it. Because I know that guilt is really one of the mm -hmm. biggest things because you possibly, which we don't, ever mm -hmm. know why he left us or why mm -hmm. he left his sister. They were very close and there's <sighs> never been another word. Very strange. There's no closure. Mm -hmm. So I challenge you. <laughs> Well, there's, <laughs> there's something about being in a room with people who get it. Yes. And so that's something that there would need to be there. There obviously would be need a support group or a, a place you can meet and a safe space. I love offering people safe spaces mm. and we feel safe when we know everybody in that room has experienced yes. something similar. Yes. And then and we can also help each other. I mean, what have you done for this? Or what have right. you, you know, how have you handled that? So there is really something to be said about being in a safe place and amongst people who get it. And I think, don't you agree that no matter what type of grief you're going through, that you need to seek people out sometimes? Mm -hmm. I mean, they even have counseling for people who lose pets. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there's some people who pets, well, I'm one of them, <laughs> who their pets are their children, you know, yeah. and it's on a, it's a different level and people are not abused, but they get ridiculed for being mm -hmm. that close to their pet. But you mentioned something earlier in the show where our grief journey is really our own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we need it validated. We need to know that it's okay 
to be grieving. I'm not grieving daily um, for my husband mm-hmm. and my mom and my grandchild, but it can hit at yes. very strange times. And um, I'm always still blindsided by it. Once it was in a dentist's chair and the, and oh. the, and I think the assistant asked, you're not taking very good care of your gums. What's, what's going on? You usually take better care of your gum. And you'd think I could just answer. Right. But instead I start crying. Oh. And it just like hit me out of nowhere. Yes. And she's like terrified and trying to shove some <laughs> Kleenex into my hand and get out of there as fast as she could. She didn't know what was happening. All right. Of course. That can, that can happen to us. But we need that validated. We need to know that's okay, that it's normal, that it, it can sideswipe us like that nine years later. I mean, just things like that. And it, it, as long as we're aware of that and we okay. have that validation, you know, then we can we can move forward and we can know this is this is normal. There's not something wrong with me. This is normal. That's an excellent point. So you don't have to beat yourself up, in other words. Yeah. So how is creativity related to grief and loss Mm -hmm. as a healing tool? I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about that. So that kind of started with the expressive writing I told you about. So once I knew there was something like that that could help other people, I thought, is there something, are there other tools that I could share with people that... Um, So I started delving into the research about creativity. Now, I come from a very creative family. My mother was very creative. So in losing her, I started looking at creativity back in 2011 and actually wrote an outline for what might have been a book, maybe. And it kind of culminated when I started to see at some of these um, At that conference I attended in Dallas, Texas, they had different meetings you could attend that were about art. And so I knew, okay, there's something to art. I'm not an artist by any means. Mm -hmm. but There's something about taking that active hands-on role. Well, it's if you think about it, when you were a little kid, you dug in the dirt, you loved finger paints, you you were always taking an active imaginative role in your world and there was no end to where your um, creativity could go to could take you until somebody told you to color inside the lines Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's in us to to be like that and then we get we get real lives and we have to have jobs and we're taking care of families and um, people like I said are telling you to color inside the lines all of a sudden and so we lose a lot of that so to find out regaining some of that, taking it back, getting our crayons back can be a healing practice. And we've seen it during the pandemic. We've seen people naturally turning to chalk drawings on the sidewalks and making hearts and putting them in their windows and maybe getting back down to playing board games with their family. And we turned towards some more natural ways of going into nature you know, that gardening, baking, all of these things that are actually inherent in us. So I have just finished some therapeutic art coach training because I've been incorporating creativity in, in small ways into our grief retreats, like painting on rocks with the person's name, or we did vision boards, we did collages because moving your hands around as a meditative practice and, and trying these different things and getting past that idea of it has to look a certain way to help Mm. us. No, it does not. We, we can get messy and play. We can play again. And part of that we can incorporate into our grief healing is because it's a natural um, activity again, proven by science that being creative and doing different creative activities can help us in our healing. Now, try to convince a man of this stuff. I'm not sure <laughs> a man would be, but it seems like women are more open to that. Although I know plenty of men and um, yes, some speakers I've had incorporate creativity into it. It's just I don't see men reaching for other people in their healing and reaching for art as as much as I do see women doing that. But I'm bound and determined to convince men just as much as women is that we all have in us and we um, we can we can help each other. And it's not a sign of weakness 
to turn to other people in your healing. And it's definitely not, you don't have to be an artist to benefit from some of these um, creative activities. I really appreciate you saying that because at the top of the show, I had mentioned that I didn't feel I was creative. Mm -hmm. And that was because I thought to be creative, you have to know how to paint a picture. And right. that was that was my view. Then after our son left us, I started mm -hmm. this show. Mm -hmm. And that is one type of, of also mm -hmm. it became a writer. And so you're right. You find what your, maybe you, you knew it was your hidden talent, right? Mm -hmm. Our very creative, uh, we have to get past the idea that creativity means a painting on a wall yes, or exactly. in a museum yeah. and start to look at, how it how it means innovative ways of looking at things maybe looking outside of the box and the brainstorming sessions you might do at work or the baking you might do in your kitchen or the gardening you might do outside all of that is a form of creativity mm -hmm. and i can't stand it when somebody says they're not creative because there's something in them and maybe other people see it and maybe they don't see it but it's it's not about a painting on a wall it's about making your life more creative and finding ways in your life to to do those creative things. Now tell us about your books in the last mm -hmm. few minutes that we have. Okay, well, The Refined by Fire, A Journey of Grief and Grace is that handbook for widows, I think. And it includes pieces of my journal and pieces of my blog. And it's um, basically my journey that can maybe help somebody else the same road and I do include the loss of my grandson in there but that's my daughter's story so I'm waiting for her to write her story um, the call to be creative a guide to reigniting your creativity is my most recent book was released in August and that is a that was a fun book <laughs> it was fun to delve into the science of creativity it was fun to talk to creative people and find out um, their creative journeys and to share a bit of my own the legacy that my mother left and my own legacy of writing for 30 some years, even though I had eight children and homeschooled, I still managed somehow to claim that one little bit of creativity. Um, so that, that was, I can't tell you how, how fun, fun that book was wow. after I, yes. after you write about grief, there's a little in there that, about grief because of course um, the healing aspect of creativity, but it was a fun book to um, to write, and it's been fun to talk about because it's one of my passions. And who would be interested in either of those books? Who who should get it? Mm -hmm. um, d does it appeal to everybody, or is there a specific group of people? I I believe I wrote "Refined by Fire for Widows." But I've found a lot of people who have lost a child or a grandchild oh. or the parent, because that's all in there. Um, they said it has resonated with them, too, because it's it's really about finding hope in loss. Okay. So anybody who's lost somebody, the call to be creative, a guide to reigniting your creativity. I think anybody who has mm. something, something inside of them that's saying, hey, maybe I remember being like that as a child or they there's this restless stirring inside of mm -hmm. them that says mm -hmm. you know what I think I want to see you know if there's something I uh, if I've got some creativity in me or you know anybody who's got that feeling maybe you were the daydreamer and in grade school, maybe you, and that's, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good thing. I tell mm -hmm. you in my book, mm -hmm. it was, yes. So I think there's something in us that's being drawn to creativity, especially right now. And we can work it into our everyday lives. In fact, we need to work it into our everyday lives for our emotional and physical and mental health. So you've given us homework. We need to start journaling mm -hmm. and we need to start finding our creativeness and you need to get your books to help us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so in a, I will post all the different places that you can be contacted, but is there anything in like a final word or an encouragement or anything that you would like to say in closing? 
Um, if you want to find me on social media, I love I love having new followers on Instagram Good. because I'm just finally figuring Instagram out. And okay. they can find me on Facebook, too. And um, I love hearing from people. So I will answer if you email or connect with me. And your books are sold Amazon? Pretty, pretty much anywhere books can be okay. purchased. Yes, okay. Amazon or your, I like to say, independent bookstores because okay. they need our help right now. Well, I appreciate what you shared. It resonated with me. I know that it's going to resonate with many people. And we look forward to seeing what the next book is you're going to write. Do you have one in mind? It took me eight and a half years, Carol. But <laughs> okay. I, have written, I have written a book I needed for my daughter when she was eight years old and lost her dad. Okay. That's, mm -hmm. oh, you haven't written? I have, no, I have not, but I've written it, and it took me eight and a half years to get there. <laughs> okay, so that's coming then. I hope so. <laughs> okay, well, with something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mary, for being on Never, Ever, Ever Give Up Hope. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for listening to Never, Ever Give Up Hope, featuring Carol Graham. Did you know that most people succeed because they are determined to? Quitting was never an option. Carol loves your comments and will respond to each one. So please subscribe and review this podcast. A rating of five stars would be outstanding and appreciated. Remember, if you are still here, there is always hope.